Good evening. My name is Dr. Christopher Dusing, and I am here with my Monday night reading group, and we are going to explore acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, Anna's going to give us an overview of the article, and then we're just going to jump right on into the deep end. Thanks for doing this, Anna. Thank you, Dr. Dusing. So for this week's reading group, we read acceptance and commitment therapy, relational frame theory, and the third wave of behavioral and cognitive therapies by Stephen Hayes. And in this article, they discussed how the different three waves of behavioral therapy and how these all came together and ended up inspiring and inciting change to create what we now know as ACT therapy, acceptance, acceptance and commitment therapy. And as you'll see from our discussion of this article, ACT is very different than the first two waves of behavioral therapies. However, you can see some similarities that shine through relating to CBT, DBT, and all of those therapies. But yes, it'll be a very interesting article. I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, ACT is connected to relational frame theory. Really with ACT, we're going into a deep dive in terms of language. Uh, ACT is a contextual um, treatment, meaning it sees everything in context, which I really love that because uh, in this modern age, we're all about targeting, um, getting very specific, narrowing our focus. And ACT to me seems uh, like a mentalization, very kind of rooted in developing the ability to mentalize and metacognition and seeing how everything is kind of connected. And not only that, is in context, in relationship with others. So thoughts, behaviors, um, emotions, again, there's a context around them that we need to understand instead of just directly targeting, such as distressing emotion, or distressing experience. ACT really goes hand in hand with DBT. I'm not sure why acceptance and commitment therapy hasn't gained more of a stronghold um, because it still tends to be a little bit of a fringe, not a fringe therapy, but not really mentioned in, in um, the third slash fourth wave therapies that we're seeing now. And a big thing too, just like DBT, the core dialectic here is acceptance uh, versus change. Uh, we are really involved in such a change-oriented society, especially in this uh, instant culture society, instant gratification uh, that we've been uh, discussing. And uh, I think ACT really highlights that uh, acceptance leads to change. And even in some ways, acceptance can be change. Really makes me think of the DBT skill of radical acceptance. Instead of being willful and fighting things, Accepting them as they are uh, creates space for change. One contrast I'll say between ACT and CBT, one thing I've never really liked about CBT, and I'm not saying this in a disrespectful way, CBT is an incredible uh, cognitively oriented therapy. In many ways, it's been around, it's been tested um, ad nauseum. However, I always felt like CBT was treating people like their car parts. So you have this certain thought, um, then that's, that's, that's a faulty thought. We're gonna take that out and drop a new thought in. It simply doesn't work that way. And I think uh, ACT really honors uh, and respects the complexity, uh, one of language, of who we are as human beings and of the presentations that we face, not necessarily difficulties or the disorders, because if we're calling things disorders, uh, we're already kind of uh, fusing to that pathological language when really we're learning to diffuse. And I see ACT too as really, um, feeding into, can we create a window of tolerance with life? And can we use specific skills to create that window of tolerance with life? And then ACT can go really deep in terms of existential uh, elements, values-driven living versus uh, smart goals-driven living, which is oftentimes what we're talking about. And I think that there's a depth to ACT and a depth to this behavioral therapy that's lacking in, in other therapies. So uh, those are my two and a half cents. I'll open up the floor. I know people want to jump right on in. I'll just piggyback off of you with saying what you said about kind of your issues with CBT, just from personal experience and learning about CBT in school, I do definitely feel like it's such a rigid structure of, well, you can't maybe change your feelings. It's very focused on changing your thoughts, but many people can't really change their thoughts. And I like what it said in the article, like, if you say to yourself, like, don't think about X, like, you are going to start thinking about that. 
it's like when they say don't think of the pink elephant all you can think of is that pink elephant so even if you try to change it with a more constructive or positive thought I feel like it it almost tells the client that there's something wrong with the thoughts they're having where it's not necessarily the thoughts that we're having that are wrong and there's nothing wrong in general it's more just our reactions to the thoughts that is what we want to change and that's what I really like about ACT. When I talk to my friends about CBT and DBT, as soon as I bring up CBT, um, quite a few of my friends have had therapy. They're like, oh, it's it's awful. And I'll be honest, when I um, tried CBT before DBT, it was because I suppose it, it, CBT is great, but I think if you're going on like disorders and BPD and stuff, it, it can really make you feel like you are the problem, which is why I loved DBT because I don't know how it's different. I've not quite worked it out yet, but DBT is so much more validating to someone who has sensitive feelings. And I think CBT has got a bit of a bad rep and I can kind of see why and I think that's why the bad reps probably linked in with DBT as well and um, so I'm kind of glad someone's mentioned about you know CBT does have bad reps because yeah I I can hear it from this side as well. Yeah I really like how both DBT and ACT adopt like a non- pathologizing stance and kind of focus on building life skills and helping the clients move towards a more valued life rather than trying to fix or eliminate those problematic thoughts or emotions. Because a lot of the times those thoughts and reactions and emotions might not make sense to us, but the client has enough evidence for themselves to, for those reactions and emotions to make sense. Um, both like DBT and ACT kind of taken more empowering approach, um, with the clients, in my opinion, rather than labeling their behaviors as like purely, um, pathological. And I think this approach in DBT is probably one of the ways that helped, um, sorry, pave the way for practices like act. I think what I like the most is um, the fact that it pulls you out of trying to be in control where it, the client is always trying to focus on their thoughts and not accepting. You know, there's an acceptance with like, for example, DBT that moves the client forward rather than focusing so much on the thought patterns and the negativity of that and the, you know, the influence of a therapist, <clears throat> you know, in, in session, I wonder about, just like Anna said, don't think about the pink elephant, the influence that could be harmful to a client is to have a therapist say, I don't want you to think about that pink elephant what does a human being normally do? The subconscious grabs onto the picture of the pink elephant. So um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's that's exactly the thing that I gathered the most about ACT um, and DBT. It's acceptance. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I have OCD and I remember when I first started going to therapy, I was, one of the therapists I had was using CBT as a primary treatment. And it kept like the constant, like, just don't think about that or identifying the types of cognitive distortions. I do think it's great and helpful for people who might be starting therapy and maybe just kind of need more information. But when those are all of the thoughts you're having, it kind of feels like you are a bit of a failure if every single thought you have fits into one of those like um, wrong thoughts. And by saying just don't have the thought, it takes the power away from the client. So I feel like that acceptance that comes with active, I can have these thoughts and still lead a values-driven life 
is what really helped me. And I know it helps others with so many across the board of so many different things, not just OCD or BPD, just in everyday life by living that values driven life and knowing like on one end, you can have these fears and have these anxieties and still do what you want to do. It doesn't, it's not an either or situation that needs to be like the thoughts need to be corrected in order to advance. I also have like kind of a personal um, relation to this because I have previously done CBT and also with learning um, in my program, I try to restructure my anxious thoughts and tell myself to kind of shift away from those anxious tendencies. Um, But recently my therapist has asked me, why are you, why are you making yourself stop thinking about this? Like you're obviously feeling this, your brain is telling you that this is enough evidence for you to feel this anxious. So why are you ruminating and telling yourself, stop thinking about it, stop thinking about it, stop thinking about it when it's keeping that cycle going. So instead we've been using ACT techniques and kind of just like accepting that the anxiety is there and letting it wash over. And it is uncomfortable, but it's less invalidating than trying to restructure or reframe my thoughts because obviously the thoughts and the emotions are there, right? And you know yourself better than a therapist does So if your body and your mind are having that physical and psychological reaction to these thoughts, telling somebody or telling yourself to think of it in a more positive light is only going to invalidate or invalidate yourself, in my opinion. I did enjoy uh, learning about the evolution of, you know, how it started out with the car parts. I'm sorry, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, But I enjoyed seeing the, you know, the evolution as it moved into basically, it was like a reorganization. And in the 90s, I saw that in the 1990s, there was a surge of that's when Lenahan and DBT became a reality. That was, I think, 93. Um, And throughout the 90s and early 2000s, they kept building upon the foundation of CBT and and the, the, I don't know, the original therapies. And I really found that interesting how they reorganized and figured out what was missing or what would improve. That part of the the document I thought was pretty, pretty interesting. And I think it highlights that that's how things evolve. And this is one of the disadvantages if we're in a culture or zeitgeist that is very siloed with therapies, uh, where therapists really are unwilling to talk about their failures. You'll see everyone talking about their um, uh, treatment successes or how this therapy is so successful for this disorder. Uh, What's in the shadows that's really interesting is uh, clinicians are unwilling or maybe um, uh, they just don't want to uh, talk about the blind spots of their therapies and also cases that they've failed at. I put out a poll a long time ago on LinkedIn and I asked how many cases have you failed in your in your career? And I had actually put over 100, 100 plus. There were only five clinicians, I think, out of 200 plus that admitted that. The vast majority of clinicians responded with that they failed 10 cases or less, which I, I didn't operationalize exactly what failure meant. However, uh, that to me just seems like a very, very low number. And if we're unwilling to say, well, you know what, what I'm doing does not cover uh, the gamut of, of, or it falls short, um, we really need to have open conversations like that to push things forward. I also too will just highlight, you know, we're talking about CBT, CBT, CBT. You know, the DBT handbook, the first one, uh, that 1993, the Red Book, I don't know if you've ever seen that, Victoria. It's called Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Borderline Personality Disorder. <laughs> so let's realize that CBT uh, and DBT are like that. Right? Only in the second edition in 2015 was it called Dialectical Behavior Therapy on the actual manual. 
I do feel like a lot of what you were talking about where you asked where you did the survey it our pride is obviously important to all of us and we don't want to admit when we may have failed or when maybe someone could have done better than us or and especially in the therapy setting it's a it's a very personal thing for the clients and we don't want to be in a way I guess responsible or not really helping them get any better but I do feel like and I know this was touched on in the article that like by having that like holding on to that sense of pride and sense of like you're the one who's in control of all of this instead of just recognizing that you and using those act principles and recognizing that you are also like side by side on the path with this client and like the river is taking you where it wants to take you both it that seems to me to promote a more healthy and probably maybe a more positive outcome and just knowing even and then by using those act principles even if you do feel like you've failed it doesn't have to necessarily be something that means you shouldn't try it again but it just means like I, these are all the times that I failed but let's look and see like how can I use this to make the next time a little bit better I think this is beautifully backed up I'm glad you brought that up Anna, on 652 um, it talks about quote if if the therapist feels trapped frustrated confused afraid angry or anxious it's the therapist's job to open up to these experiences recognizing the humanizing opportunity they provide to put themselves into the shoes of their clients and do the same work without avoiding or moving uh, one up so really it can highlight in terms of how we can dehumanize our clients even well-intentioned therapists uh, such as oh wow they were unwilling to do uh, the cbt assignments that i i i uh, assign or uh, they're, they're unwilling to identify this core belief, we really have to realize, again, context. There's context, intersubjectivity between the client, therapist, and also all the other contexts that we're operating in. Yeah, but I believe it was mentioned in this article, something similar where, or maybe I, this might've been a LinkedIn post that I read, but someone was talking about how it can be hard feeling like your client isn't progressing, but also, or you're hearing your client say they're not progressing, but also knowing that they have not attended like over half of the sessions and things like that. And I'm sure that is extremely stressful for the client, but then it's also, or for the clinician, but then it's also taking into account why might they have not attended the sessions? What could I be doing differently and even though that might feel like a failure on your part, it's reframing it and using, it kind of reminds me of that act principle that there's not really a truth. It's more just, so maybe maybe you're not a failure and maybe they're not a failure. Maybe this is just another opportunity for you both to grow. Like act, just because this happened doesn't have to mean that this bad thing is going to happen. We've actually talked a lot about perceived failures um, as their therapists in that context. And there are so many different reasons why a therapist client relationship might not come to the conclusion that the therapist had visioned for themselves. And I think as therapists and mental health professionals, Sometimes we try to dehumanize ourselves and take away our own personal experiences, emotions, and biases because it is like that not being that blank slate is such a controversial topic in the therapy community. But I think it's important to just recognize that a one size fit all approach will never work for anyone and you are one person and you're going to do things the way that you do it. And sometimes you aren't going to be the approach that that client needs and that's not your fault and it's not the client's fault. And it's to acknowledge that it's sometimes better for the client to move on to somebody who would be better suited to them. And although this is like our career and our life's work, and it's hard not to take things like that personally, 
it's really important for yourself and especially the client's growth to take it as like least seriously as possible in that sense, because at the end of the day, the goal is for the client to gain the skills or um, growth that they want. And it's really not about you. It's about them and what they need. You know, oddly enough, that happened to me. It wasn't working. And it was somewhat mutual. And ironically, the conversation to lead this therapist I was seeing, the conversation was more groundbreaking than the sessions that I had had because we were being completely open, say everything to each other. And I thought about it driving home and I thought, if I'd have had that, <laughs> you know, then I would not have felt that disconnect. But maybe it taught her because I am that person that believes in say everything and it didn't work. So maybe it taught her a little something. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny how that works. Like you talking about that thing almost like made a point in time where that really like you, you were feeling connected to her. And even if ultimately you decided to go down another path and choose another therapist, there was like that moment where you were talking about the exact opposite of kind of how you were feeling in that exact session. Like, it's really interesting how that, how that happened. And I feel like that, I feel like that's common. Like when you are completely open and honest and tell someone like, I'm feeling this way, I'm feeling this way. Usually like you, it, it just, you feel so much better. And even if ultimately, you know, that you want to go down a different path, at least you have that moment of clarity or realization like all right this is this this is available to me maybe maybe with someone else i had the clarity i felt a presence in a in a wall not for me <laughs> and then when it opened up the wall came crumbling down and i'm thinking well wait <laughs> i think that point that you just made makes me feel more positive about my outlook on self-disclosure as a therapist, obviously to use it ethically and in a way that's going to help guide the conversation and the growth and making sure to maintain the focus on the client. But be being this like clinical, stoic, inhuman being might work for some people, but if you are wanting like comfortability and like a safe space to share um, things that you don't want to share elsewhere, in my opinion, I think that that self-disclosure and that humanization of yourself is needed because self-disclosure is going to happen and it's going to happen by the way that the clothes that you wear, what you keep in your office, like all of these things are going to like, your clients are going to put puzzle pieces together and make you out to be who they think that you are in their head. But by kind of like letting yourself be humorous from time to time when it's appropriate and not being like such a clinical thing, I think that that really helps to garner a better therapeutic relationship, a more positive one and a more comfortable one. I have a saying I tell myself, avoid the two R's. Avoid being rigid and avoid being ridiculous. Ridiculousness, too much disclosure, too much that sort of thing. I think I might say though, don't avoid it because it's impossible. You're going to become rigidified. You're going to be absolutely ridiculous sometimes in therapy, ridiculously wrong, uh, whether it's you or your modality. I was really spoiled by my first therapist, I've got to be saying. Um, so the first time, well, I did have a therapist before, a CBT, but I think that lasted for about a whole of three sessions. But my DBT therapist, I was very spoiled. She seemed to be very 
she seemed to be the right one for me. So since then going into other therapies from being luckily managed to get a perfectly suited therapist to me is kind of like, oh no, you know, like I'm trying to not not find a, a version, but just get the connection that I had with the first one. And it, it's it's really difficult. And I think, you know, I, I keep saying to myself, you've got to be open to new people, new ways of working. And I do, I'm, I carry on going and going. And then I think, is it me that's, um, is it connecting or am I just rebelling against it? it? It gets very confusing sometimes. But yeah, I think when you've got the right therapist, that's that's where work can really go forward. It really can make a huge difference. Or maybe you have the right therapist and the right client in the context of the therapeutic uh, relationship. Again, it's all, all interconnected there. A lot of people really pin a lot on the therapist. We have to be the right therapist with our, what let's say in here, our big shovel to help dig people out of holes. That really cracked me up. Uh, and Taylor touches on it. I mean, we're human beings. Uh, we need to be humanized too uh, by ourselves. And also too, it, not necessarily that it's the client's responsibility, but um, I think the outlook in general, I, I think that we can kind of have uh, transferences upon us that uh, we're magic healers, soothsayers, all that. Um, and really we're just as human and flawed and oftentimes struggling just as much as uh, the individuals that uh, we are working with, if not more. <laughs> if we remember the Wounded Healers article, there's a lot of therapists that are uh, possibly bleeding out. <laughs> I had a pretty harsh criticism from two very good friends. Uh, let me just say everything. Uh, why all of the alphabet soup? What are you studying? What are you doing? And I actually took offense to that. I said, hey, let me tell you what it stands for and what it's about. But um, I don't know if any of you have experienced that. And also, there is a statement, and I believe it might have been from a previous reading that we had, but the statement is psychotherapists encourage greater independence, yet behavioralists are more author authoritarian. Is that a fact? Do, we can't all fit, you know, therapists cannot all fit the same mold, just as our clients do not all fit the same mold. So it's just, a, it's something that I wanted to bring up as a, as a point that I carry it with me in the back of my head because I argue with it a little bit. And I don't think that, I, I don't believe in boxing anything, nor do I believe in boxing what we are modalities that we specialize in nor do i believe boxing in my client i might have four clients with anxiety i'm not going to say oh anxiety you know and put it in that box i'm not going to do it yeah i mean if if we're thinking of it in the act kind of framework just because i feel like it's been on my mind a lot and i know you said like is this is this true or like is this false like I feel like by defining it, like you said, it boxes it boxes the therapist in, it boxes the client in into only feeling like they're able to either act in that certain way, behave in that certain way, even feel that certain way. So I feel like shifting from the thought or shifting the kind of what you're valuing to be from like, is this true or like what is true to... I guess something maybe more thinking of it in a way like how like how has this shown up in my experiences like what have I experienced with therapists who have acted this way or even myself but then like also thinking of contradictions to that like what maybe there was a behavior therapist or something that was com completely like very just free flowing, let the client just go wherever they wanted to go. Or maybe there was like a psychoanalyst who maybe was a little bit more rigid and authoritarian. I feel like finding those like discrepancies, it, 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 it opens your mind. I have grown more uh, 
exponentially more from the cases that I failed at, that I've had incredible difficulties with, uh, that I've struggled with, uh, that I haven't managed the countertransferences or treatment destructive resistances or treatment interfering behaviors. Uh, wealth of my knowledge is contained in those cases. Uh, that my success stories, I've learned a lot from those as well. Uh, however, you have to take a step outside your comfort zone. And I want to speak to this as well. This is another thing I've been thinking about is we're always told to niche down, right? niche down, specialize. Um, again, this this treatment for this disorder or I only treat this disorder. In some ways, I feel like what's been lost is the value in being a generalist. And what I mean by that is you don't treat everyone. You don't treat every disorder. However, there's general values and principles and skills, emotional regulation skills, mindfulness skills that the therapist uh, employs in whatever session you're in uh, to hold cases that are difficult. I feel like a lot of people are sticking in their comfort zones, in their silos, in their tribes, and are again, are unwilling to kind of take a step back, diffuse really, right? Theoretically diffuse away, not be so attached, and even laugh at oneself too. Like I love, everyone knows that how much I love modern psychoanalysis. And I love uh, in this article where they're really making fun of Freud and the classic analysts by um, going too deep, interpretation upon interpretation upon interpretation. That uh, one happening in Han's life had to do with castration anxiety or defecation or all this. And really, we just wanted to change the fucking behavior. <laughs> So can we laugh at ourselves and see the blind spots and be like, yeah, you know what, this 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 uh, theoretical modality, uh, there's big holes in it, big gaps, and I still love it. Judith, I just had um, my own opinions on what you said about behaviorism and versus psychotherapy, and I think a lot of people would agree that early behaviorists were very authoritative when you go back to that operant and classical conditioning. But um, now I'm, I'm currently working within the ABA scope as a instructor therapist, and I've worked in places that are very authoritative over the clients still to this day. They kind of stick back to that framework of we're going to condition these kids to do this skill which I don't agree with. My current workplace now, we really incorporate the kids into what they're learning and making sure that the skills are generalizing. And I don't know what I'm trying to say here. The skills are ones that they want to learn and not ones that the analyst or the parent think that they need to make their lives better because kids, these kids are put in therapy to learn these skills and to reduce these problem behaviors. And there's really this overarching sense of these kids are here to make everyone else's life easier, but why are we not thinking about this is this kid is living this life? Why are we trying to be like a trainer? This is their life. These are human beings with emotion. So I do definitely agree that behaviorism was rooted in a more authoritative um, sense. But I think most current behavior analysts are kind of trying to get out of that. But I know it's definitely still like present in the space. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I was just talking about ABA therapy and I would love to like hear from you about like your experience working with it and kind of how it differs. But yeah, how it is it does seem to be rooted in making, not necessarily making the client's life easier because they, their own interests are almost what the therapy and society is trying to change in order to mold them to fit into society and be a quote unquote functioning member of society. Like we even still use that when talking about autism, like high functioning, low functioning. And it, 
it's it needs that reframe of like is everyone is functioning maybe they're just not functioning in the way that society expects them to or thinks they should and it does make me think like I know it, it involves a lot of like that exposure therapy like and taking the children to places and things like that to kind of get them like acclimated or like condition them which is a good way to put it but when I think of like the OCD exposure therapy it's being done for a different reason because the clients feel like they want to do all of these things but they feel like they can't because of their anxiety whereas a lot of times with people with autism it's it might not even be that they necessarily want to do these things it's that they have they their interests don't really lie there but they're still being pushed to do those things because it's like the societal norm so I think that needs a reframe Within the ABA scope, they have started to adopt, um, act into their practice. And a lot of behavior analysts have been taking CEUs on how to use this program called AIM, which is basically a program made for children that uses the ACT hexaflex and teaches the main principles of ACT in a way that makes more sense to children. I think specifically the program was created for children with autism and it uses characters to like do the present moment values, committed action. They've kind of made the act hexaflex into a more simplified language, but it's really, really helped some of my clients feel like their thoughts and reactions to things are not abnormal and they're normal to them and it makes sense to them and it's okay to have those thoughts and it's okay to experience those things and they're not being told to change the way that they're thinking just to accept it know that it's happening and like live through it I really resonate with this entire conversation because about like two summers ago, I was a student aide at a school in the UK that was only for children kind of, they marked it as behavioral issues, but I worked with a lot of um, kids with autism and basically the framework of the entire school was kind of not a lack of authority, like authoritarian figures, but they completely dismantled the traditional, you know, the teacher stands at the front of the room, everyone's sitting rigidly and they let the kids decide hey I'm I'm ready to go do science now and instead of a traditional like one two three I have this curriculum it was okay this student is really interested in frogs so we talked all about the biology of frogs or this student is really interested in chemistry and it was really wonderful and really rewarding to see teachers really reward that behavior because you could see that like students start to learn so much when you take a small interest of theirs like for example I remember my first day my supervisor kind of sat me down and was like you know these children most of them have a really big problem with authority you're this new American person <laughs> coming in and they're probably not going to be really welcoming of you for a while it's going to take a long time for them to warm up and that was really hard for me. I'd never been kind of put in that situation. And I slowly kind of just started like, I think my first week I didn't talk to anyone and I slowly just observed and I saw what the different kids were interested in. And I saw ways that I could spark up conversation or interests. And I started bringing in my own crafts from home for some of the girls. And it was super rewarding to build those relationships. And at the end of the summer, you know, I built such strong connections with a lot of the students and seeing the, they're also psychotherapists on staff. So seeing the way they work with these children is a lot of what we're, what you guys are talking about right now. It's definitely in practice. And in my experience, it's been working and it's been super rewarding for both supervisors and children. So I think it's so important that we're still having these conversations and, you know, we're still figuring that out and hopefully implementing that more. So yeah, those are just my two cents. <laughs> I really like that whole, that sounds like a great experience, first of all, but I really like what you said about like kind of that their goal was to like dismantle that like hierarchical structure in their school. And it's great that they were able to do that with children 
in one of my classes that I took my freshman year of college, it was a gender studies class. And the professor was talking about like um, feminist theory and uh, feminist teaching styles. And the classroom was structured in the same way. Like the, he didn't stand in the front. Like we, we didn't call him like professor. We just called him like his first name. It was very much like just a, a group of people having a conversation. And that's with like older people, like young adults. So I'm sure it looks different for children just because the interests are different. But yeah, it just like the conversations led where we wanted them to go. And I really like that you said that, like when you mentioned the thing about like the frogs or like the interests that the students were interested in. And I feel like that just adds so much, like it really, it validates the person's experience and interests. And when you're validating their interest, it, it makes, I'm I'm sure like they, maybe not all the time, but they were probably interested in learning about that or super interested in teaching their peers about something that they're interested in. And I'm sure Taylor, it's the same thing when the boy that you're, you were talking about, like, even if you, we might not share that same interest, like just by validating that and like expressing that, like we are listening, I feel like that just goes such a long way. Yeah, definitely. And I think also sometimes people can like underestimate how much power that truly has. Cause I saw students at like the center that I was working at, it was actually people of like all ages. So we had kids as young as six and we had students leaving high school. So through the end of their time at the center, they were equipped to take standardized tests. A lot of them ended up applying for university that they never would have thought like they could do that they possess the skill to have, or they possess like the mental kind of, not even mental capability, but ability to process their emotions or whatever they were going through, like any reason that they were there to seek help. So it was super rewarding. I think that there's so much to be learned in, in that world. And, you know, if we take it more seriously, like I've seen a lot of great results in that way. Taylor, if I may ask you a question, I'm, I'm kind of curious. When you have parents who are highly traditional, very concerned about society as a whole, where I feel that, and I, I don't know if this sounds controversial or not, but I feel that traditions and societal norms are part of the problem that the entire globe has, okay? <laughs> so when you when you work with parents, who are, have you had issues with parents who are so, I hate to overuse the word, rigid? And how do you best handle that? How do you, I know you probably have an amazing presence and inside you might be, you know, frustrated, but I was just curious how, how you would handle that. It's really funny that you use the word rigid because that is one of the main things that most parents want to skill train out of their children. And they are not able to look in a mirror and realize the rigidity that they hold in their own lives. I think that when a parent comes to us about something that is more about the comfortability of themselves or society as a whole, it is definitely a difficult conversation to have because you have to walk that fine line with a parent relationship as well. But we had a parent who wanted us to basically extinguish their child's stimming, which is not something that happens. That's how children with autism regulate. And it has no negative effect on anyone, the people around them, except for maybe those societal perceptions. So I had to have that conversation and be like, honestly, I don't think that that's something that we would ever do. Give them the psychoeducation on what stimming is, why a child with autism might do that. By the end, they understood more and they were able to see why that's not something that we would ever work on because 
why would we extinguish their child's regulatory system and things that they use to as a calming strategy when it's not harming the child, not harming anyone else except um, ignorant people giving a few looks in the grocery store, you know? So I think psychoeducation is a huge tool that can help people just understand the reasoning behind things. And I know for myself in my own therapy, maybe it's because I'm a psychology student, but I really like to know the whys and the hows behind things. And it makes so much more sense. And it's more than just like telling them, no, that parents are going to, if parents are paying for the kids to have therapy, they're going to want to know why you don't want to do something. Right. In another act book, I read that <clears throat> one of the hallmarks of good mental hygiene, good mental health uh, is cognitive flexibility, flexibility. So you really want to pay attention to the rigidity and those spots of rigidity in our clients and ourselves, because as it says here, control is the problem. And if we think about therapy sessions, oh, when do therapists get most rigid or tend to um, kind of seize up is maybe we don't know what to do, or maybe something doesn't fit neatly into our uh, clinical paradigm. And again, coming back to what I was saying earlier, these are opportunities for growth to kind of look deep within and be like, what's this about? What's this why about? Let me take this into my own analysis. Let me take this into my supervision uh, so that I can be present with this and accept it and then work with it. I like ACT too, because if we <laughs> look at the techniques, it's like confronting the system. Control is the problem, right? We need to diffuse away from um, uh, language and structures. I almost get the sense that uh, there's a subversive element to this, which uh, I've talked about um, with psychoanalysis. There seems to be a subversive element in terms of saying everything. So in a bigger sense, uh, I like what uh, ACT is uh, throwing out in terms of that vibe. However, that could be my interpretation. Yeah, I do like that too. And I feel like you could also tie that into different like philosophies and like ways of thinking like Marxism, things like that. Um, I'm I'm always thinking about things like that too. So it's just pretty interesting to hear a therapy like this therapy. It, it speaks to me because I feel like it, it doesn't seem like just used for therapy. Like this seems like something that like, I know you just did a talk with DBT in in business like this kind of gives that same vibe that like this could be used in the workplace it could be used to help like our societies run better things like that maybe not like a super rigid framework but more so just like taking those some of those ideas into account i really like how i really like how act kind of promotes seeing these negative thoughts or situations as kind of separate from yourself with that cognitive diffusion. And instead of trying to change the contents of your thoughts, like accepting that it's there and allowing yourself to experience it, but bringing it away from you in order to see it as a smaller thing. It kind of parallels what I was thinking. Uh, so a CBT is trying to bring us a little full circle you know, car parts, right? We're identifying faulty uh, thought patterns or core beliefs. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but like what Taylor was saying, perhaps if we can diffuse, right? And kind of um, ask, what is this about? Let me accept this. Let me get curious. Perhaps a client can come to their own conclusion that that core belief is not functional or that core belief is faulty. And that is worth uh, so much more than a therapist analyzing, interpreting, dictating, uh, this is the right way to think and this is the wrong way to think. And to be able to exercise this type of flexibility that we're talking about, tying us back again to something I've been thinking a lot about, humility, uh, therapeutic humility, and also just being a human humility in terms of uh, we have just a piece of the puzzle here and there's so much more to know. And oftentimes that's contained in our clients' 